Thank you very much for coming, everyone who's in the room and all the people who've dialed in on Zoom. Hopefully you are here for Neotron, my attempt at writing a single tasking DOS for ARM microcontrollers in Rust. There's no shame in suddenly getting up and running away if you are in, in fact, the wrong room. Um, so who am I? What, uh, what do I do? Well, I'm an embedded systems engineer by trade. It's sort of this weird gray space between computer science and um, electrical engineering and electronics. That's in fact what my degree was in. Um, these days I mainly program in and teach Rust. I am a Rust trainer. Um, I have done C++, Python, Pascal, Basic, Modular 2, Tickle, Perl, PHP, um, all sorts of things in the past but it's mainly Rust these days. You can find me at ferrisystems.com. You can hire me to give some Rust training or some of my excellent team. And um, we also have open sessions available through Skills Matter. You can sign up for those. On GitHub and on most places, I am the JPster. I came to Twitter rather late. So there I am, the real JPster, because somebody took my nickname first. Um, and everything you see here is, uh, is on the website for the project, which is neotroncompute.github.com. Oh, so what are we going to be talking about today? Well, I want to take you on a sort of a journey in four parts, maybe four and a half. We'll do some demo and stuff at the end. I've got some hardware on the desk. Um, those of you in the room will be able to see the hardware on Zoom. Sorry, I might try and pull the camera off its mount later so you can have a look. Uh, There's journey in four main parts then. What we're going to talk about what is an operating system? I think to talk about why I decided to write one, it's useful to discuss what an operating system, in fact, is. We're going to look through the history of the operating system, a um, variety of different machines and operating systems from the past. We're going to look at sort of what constitutes a modern operating system, what kind of things we expect from our operating systems. And then at the end, we'll talk about the one I've decided to write um, probably turned out to be a terrible idea, but that's, I guess, what makes interesting talks. Um, for those of you in the room, and I guess those of you on Zoom, you can play along as well, or if you're watching the recording in the future, let's play a little game. Every time I mention a company that is no longer with us, uh, if you're on Discord, you can press F to pay respects, but in the room, you can just sort of forlornly wave your hands to mourn companies, uh, companies of the past. There will be one or two of them as we go through. So let's start off with some, some definitions. So we're sort of all on the same page. So when we say OS, we generally mean an operating system. I normally use the short form OS. Uh, you may see the term DOS or DOS. Um, technically, this means a disk operating system. It is just an operating system that is designed to and quite good at dealing with files on disks as opposed to I don't know, a tape operating system or any other kind of operating system. Um, very often people use the word DOS to mean specifically the one Microsoft wrote for the IBM PC, which we'll talk about in some detail later, but I use it in its more generic sense. So when I say a DOS, I just mean an operating system that's sort of aimed at, aimed at disks and not 3D graphics and all the other fancy things we expect a modern operating system to do. Um, you may be familiar with the term real-time operating system. I think for me, this then gets into a really interesting discussion about what is a computer, what is a general purpose computer, and what is an embedded system. And my definition uh, of a general purpose computer is this. You can walk up to it and you can get it to run a program of your invention that the designer of the computer hadn't envisaged. I think that's, a, that's my definition. And in, if you can't do that, it's an embedded system. So if it's like an Arduino, it's an embedded system because I can't walk up to my Arduino and program it. I need to bring another computer with me. The system sort of has to be self-contained. Whereas if it's got a screen and a keyboard and some kind of programming language on it, then for me, that makes it uh, a general purpose computer. We can have long discussions in the bar afterwards as to whether you think an iPhone is a general purpose computer or an embedded system. Real-time operating systems, very much in the space of embedded systems. It, everything just gets compiled together. It has a, a job to do, and I can't. If it's running free RTOS, I can't generally go up to it, pop open a shell, and type in some 
free RTOS shell code. That's just not a, not a thing you get. So let's talk about what, uh, what an operating system or a disk operating system does. So we're going to divide this first part of the talk into, into four pieces. What does a DOS do? It runs applications, it runs on a computer, it manages files on disk, and it gives you some level of portability. So let's take those in turn. What do we mean by an application? Um, I feel quite bad. Having, having watched um, Patricia's talk this morning with the gorgeous slideware, um, I am not an artist, I am an engineer. These slides are written in Markdown. On special occasions, I have handwritten some SVG for you and embedded it in the slide. So this is about as good as the graphics are going to get. Um, but let's think about what, what is an application? Well, an application, really, it's a piece of software that deals with two things. It deals with input and it deals with output. And I think you can frame pretty much any computer program. That's what we mean by application. It's the term app these days is, is more popular, but they are programs. They deal with input and they produce output. You know, the drawing program, the drawing app I give my kids when they're bored in Pizza Express and we're waiting for our dinner. The input is, you know, uh, touch input on the, um, on the capacitive touch screen and the output is graphics and pixels. You know, a picture of daddy with laser beams coming out of his eyes and his hair on fire. Um, but that's what the application is doing. It's taking input and it is producing output. And then there's probably uh, some, some of that is transient and then some of that um, is long lasting. So there's probably some storage, but you can think of your storage as being a combination of input and output. I can write something out to file and then I can load it in from file later. So when we want to go home and show mummy the picture of daddy with his hair on fire, we have input and output. In the olden days, as we will see, input was probably some paper tapes or a stack of punched cards, and your output was probably more paper tape. Um, but we, we, st we still stick with these terms of, of input and output, and as we go through, I think we'll see that a lot of the terms we, we still use and rely on in computing are, are embedded in, in the, say, distant past, um, certainly in the, not in the recent past. So we have this idea of applications that are just processing input and output. What else does a DOS do? Well, we say it runs on a computer, which then leads us to the question, what is a computer? Um, to me, a, a computer is made of a couple of things. It has a central processing unit inside it that does not necessarily need to be an integrated circuit or a chip. It could be a collection of 12 printed circuit boards covered in valves or transistors. But there is some kind of processing unit which executes instructions. So we have this idea that the central processing unit has a list of things we can give it to do, or it has a, a set of things it can do, and the program or the application is a list of what you should do. You can add numbers together, you can move things around, we can store data in, in temporary registers. The other key part of a computer is the memory. Memory, I like to model memory as the, um, the lockers you find at your local municipal swimming pool. There's just a whole bunch of them, and they all have a number. You can open the door of number 325, put some stuff in it, shut the door. You can go back later and go and fetch it. That's all memory is. The size of a location in memory is a byte. Uh, question for the audience, how big is a byte? Feel free to shout it out. Eight bits. Wrong. The answer, as in all computer science questions, is it depends. Uh, I spent most of my time working on a Bluetooth chip which had 16-bit bytes. And there's a reason that the C standard allows for such things. Um, it's just more efficient. If you've only got a 16-bit address space, but you can address 16 bits with every address, it saves you having to move to a 17-bit address space. It's, uh, it's quite efficient. Uh, yeah, char bits in the standard is definitely not always eight. Um, unless you're programming in Rust, where they've looked at that and gone, that's weird, we're not doing that. And in Rust, they've definitely said, we only support platforms with, uh, with an 8-bit uh, byte. Um, so, but byte is the word we use for each location in memory. Um, we also have this distinction between volatile and non-volatile memory. Volatile memory will lose its contents when the power is off over the course of seconds to minutes. Fun fact, you can use a can of sp freezer spray and take the memory dim out of a laptop and read the contents out, you know, a couple of minutes later. 
Um, but generally, volatile memory decays when the power goes out. Non-volatile memory also decays when the power goes out, but generally over the course of decades rather than minutes, um, which is why you often need to replace the ROM if you've got a Commodore 64 or something like that. We've got a question in the room. Yeah. The question is, if a byte is 16 bits, can a nibble be 8 bits? Um, it depends. Uh, I, I guess you would have to refer to the architecture manual for your, for your chosen weird processor. I don't recall the Bluetooth chip I worked on. It was the CSR Blue Core 5. I don't recall the manual saying anything about nibbles. Um, I think they generally only come on 8-bit systems when it's useful to talk about 4-bit quantities. Um, it's a good question, though. Eight bit nibble. So we have our memory, we have volatile and non volatile memory. We need some non volatile memory in our computer because it needs to do something when we switch it on. If you don't have that, then you have an Altair 8800 and you must flip dip switches on the front to punch in the instructions one at a time. Um, we moved past that relatively quickly and Pretty much every computer has some kind of non-volatile memory in it, even if it's only, uh, I think on an Amstrad PCW, there's 256 bytes of non-volatile memory, and that is precisely enough to load the first track off the disk, which then contains the, the rest of the operating system. Uh, the Amiga, original classic OG Amiga, had only about 256 bytes of ROM, which was enough to load the actual ROM from floppy into a special RAM. The reason they did that was because the ROM wasn't finished and they couldn't afford EPROMs. So they just copied the ROM from floppy to, to RAM. And they continue to do that for some time, in fact. Um, what else does a computer need? Well, we've got a processor, we've got some memory, and we need our input-output devices. These are the things that our application is going to talk to. Input-output devices often pretend uh, to be memory. Um, they are memory mapped. They, we just give them another address. So some of our addresses are actual memory, and some of our addresses are, in fact, these magic I.O. devices pretending to be memory. Displays, keyboards, storage, comms devices, we're familiar with these things. Um, let's look at a picture, an example of a computer. This is an IBM System 360 Model 30. This machine first launched in 1965. Uh, anyone want to guess how much RAM we've got in this machine? 64, that is the correct answer. This machine has 64K of 8-bit bytes. Um, the CPU runs at 1 megahertz. And I, th I say CPU, it's definitely not a chip. It's definitely large racks of, of cards covered in transistors at this point. Um, however, it's microcoded, so it only performs 35,000 operations per second. Reading from register takes eight clock cycles. Um, so this is a machine that's sort of fairly fairly slow and, and, and sluggish. It does have hard drives, though. My notes say it's got two, but I think we can see three on the screen. Maybe this one has been upgraded. Um, but yeah, those are five megabyte fixed disks. This is the opposite of a floppy disk. It's fixed. You can't take it out. Um, and this machine retailed for about $130,000 in 1960s money. So this is 1965. Let's jump forward only 15 years. 15, 16 years. So we're looking at the IBM PC 5150. So this is before the XT, before the 80. This is the original. So we now have a 4.77 megahertz 8088. We still have 64K of RAM. That is the standard. I think you could get them with as little as 16, but 64K. Um, the machine has a lot more in common with a Commodore 64 than you might imagine, because out of the box, it comes with Microsoft Basic in ROM and an interface to plug in a cassette deck. You can buy your IBM PC without a floppy drive, and you can just do basic and loading and saving off tape. That was taken out of the, the ROMs fairly early on as they realized people really just wanted the disk drives. The disk drives saw 320K. Uh, let's look at another computer. I think it's a computer. Raspberry Pi Pico. RP2040 microcontroller there. We've now got 256K of RAM, two megabytes of flash memory, and two 32-bit processors at 133 megahertz. 
the main chip on this board costs 75 cents. The whole board will cost you about $4, which is, I think it's just extraordinary. And then it brings me to the question, if this is a computer and this is a computer, why can't I make this a computer? Why is this limited to being an embedded system? Why can I not walk up to it and run software on it of my choosing exactly as I would with an IBM PC? So we talked about what a, what a DOS does. We said it runs applications, it runs on a computer, and we've looked at some of those. Um, it's in the name. We need to manage files on disk. This is what disks look like to the operating system. So if you imagine this is the, the surface of the, the sort of the flexible plastic material that's inside a floppy disk, it could also represent one of the platters in your hard drive. Um, modern SSDs uh, obviously don't, aren't made of spinning disks of rust anymore, but still some of the concepts we use when we talk with two SSDs, they, they hop back to this kind of thing. So we have this idea of a track, and the track is the red ring highlighted in A, and we access tracks by moving a stepper motor in and out. Then we have the idea of a sector. Unfortunately, this is where computer science people disagree with the maths people, because the maths people would tell you that B is a sector, that is the sector of a circle, um, whereas the computer science people will tell you that C is in fact the sector, that is a small piece of track. Tracks are made of sectors, and then generally the operating system will deal with multiple sectors at once, and we call those a cluster. So we can now see how it's the job of the operating system to sort of move this head around, wait for the disk to spin, which when you're a processor takes an eternity for the right sector the correct sector to be under the read right head so you can do the read or you can do the right. Um, and you can imagine there are lots of interesting challenges in how do you determine when one sector ends and the next one starts. If I, re if I write over an existing sector, how do I make sure I do the right on time and the end of my sector doesn't overlap the start of the next one, which would be problematic. So there's lots of challenges there in being a disk operating system. Is an example of one. This is the classic Microsoft disk operating system as shipped with the IBM PC, the later version, this is MS-DOS 6. But the operating system, we've asked it for a directory listing and we can see it's giving us file names. We have a directory, so we understand we have some sense of hierarchical arrangement of our, of our files. We can put files in folders. I guess that harks back to a filing cabinet analogy, ultimately. Um, the files are marked with timestamps. Weirdly, I think these are in year, month, day. Uh, I don't think that's the 94th of May, 1931. I think that is 1994. Um, operating systems have to understand locales and understanding what country the users are in because different countries like to put their dates and times in, in different orders. So, said disk operating systems have to manage files on disk. I think the last key thing an operating system needs to do is, uh, is to handle portability. And to discuss portability, let's, let's try and imagine a world where there is no operating system. The operating system and the application simply get compiled together as one, and that's all we have on our computer. And what that would mean is it's the application that runs from boot up. And in fact, there are, there are machines like this. Again, the Amstrad PCW, the Amstrad word processor from the late 80s you put in your word processor disk and it booted the machine and it booted the word processor. And if you wanted to run something different, you switched it off, you took the disk out and put a different disk in. But that then gets a bit frustrating. People very often want to use their very expensive computers to do different things at the same time. And we can't do that when the operating system and the applications are tied together. If you're in the word processor, yeah, how do you then switch out and, and run the spreadsheet instead? And then we also get interesting questions like, how do I run my application on a different computer? If it's, if it's tied in with the operating system, then it's tied into the specifics of what that machine looks like. It's expecting certain I.O. devices at certain addresses. It's expecting a certain amount of memory, which is fine if I'm running my software on my computer. But if you want to get into a world where you sell software or give software away, People have a reasonable expectation that it will run on their computer and their computer will differ from yours in lots of interesting and exciting ways that you won't find out until they call you up to complain. So 
I think if you try and imagine this world, you very quickly get to a to a system where you go, actually, let's let's split these applications apart. Let's move out the bits that are common, the bits of the application that are operating the computer system, and let's divide them out. And now we have a piece of software which is uh, concerns itself only with the computer. So it concerns itself with how the computer is arranged, what memory it has, and what the I/O um, subsystems are, and then the applications simply need to concern themselves with what the operating system looks like. And that's what gives you this, this sort of layer of portability. Applications look at the operating system and the operating system hides a multitude of sins that are going on underneath and presents a sort of a sensible, perhaps fictional view of the world. And the operating system then deals with the mess of the computer underneath. And so that's, our, that's section one. That is our brief run through of, I think, what a, what a disk operating system does. So let's look at some classic examples of operating systems. Start back with, I think, if not the one of the, the oldest ones, the Leo Master Program, which ran uh, on the Leo One or the Leo range of computers. I think it was the first commercial computer. Uh, people based in Germany who were big fans of the Zuse company um, may argue that Konrad Zuse was selling computers um, before the Leo was. Does anyone know who made the Leo? Lost time. Well, you can get ready to wave your hands in the air because it was, in fact, J. Lyons Tea Rooms. So press F to pay respects for J. Lyons Tea Rooms. Why did a tea room company feel the need to make a computer? It's a very interesting story. You can go to the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge and they are doing a, 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 big, a big online archive and displays there based around the, um, the Leo, because at this point, people are starting to forget that it ever existed. The reason a tea room needs to invent the, the world's first commercial computer is because when you have hundreds of tea rooms, they need to place the next day's orders. How many sponge fingers do you need? How many trifles do you need? How many bags of tea do you need? And they would telephone head office and place the order for the next day. But then someone needs to collate the orders from all of the tea rooms. I need to sum the total number of sponge fingers I need and send that to the sponge finger warehouse. I need to sum all of the tea, send it to the tea warehouse. And so they decided, well, we've heard of this thing called EDSAC at Cambridge University. And they went there and they spoke to them and they went, well, I think we'll make one of these for ourselves. And so J Lyons Tea Rooms got into the computer business. The machine was built using 6,000 tubes and 12,000 relays. So we are definitely pre-transistors at this point. And it ran the bakery values application in 1951, possibly the first example of running a commercial application on a computer system. Um, and then by the time you get to Leo 3, the master program is able to run 12 different applications simultaneously. Um, well, that's perhaps not ideal terminology for today's world. I've pulled this out of a report from Automatic Digital Computation um, if you find the slides online, you'll get the link. But I'm going to read this out because I think this is absolutely fascinating. I, we need to do more of this. And, I, and I'll, I'll imagine this is being read in the, in the clip tones of a 1950s BBC TV presenter. An unusual feature, which has been found valuable in fault finding, is a loudspeaker connected to a waveform in the central control circuits of the machine. This loudspeaker makes a noise depending on the sequence of orders being carried out, and every large program has its own characteristic rhythm. Should the machine stop or go permanently into a closed loop, the fact is instantly apparent. In testing the machine on simple repetitive programs, a single failure is easily detected as a break or a click in the continuous tone. This is a fabulous idea, and I think more programs should produce a characteristic hum or buzz because you could instantly hear when they go wrong. Um, it's been lost to history. We need to, we need to bring this back. So uh, IBM probably don't need to press F for them, I thought, but they're, they're still kind of going. May not be in the PC business, but I think we'll let, we'll let IBM go. IBM System 360. So we've moved forward a few years to 1964, and this is the operating system for the IBM System 360, the machine we saw the picture of earlier. You may think being late and resource hungry is a, is a, a symptom of modern software. That is not so. IBM C System 360 operating system was somewhat late and resource hungry. And consequently, they had to ship 
I think, three or four other operating systems in the meantime, whilst they got this one finished. Um, we had the basic operating system, we had the tape operating system, there was one called the disk operating system. Um, and it all basically happened because uh, when people bought the machines, they skimped on the hardware, or they bought what IBM told them they would need. And then it turned out the OS needed far more RAM than they'd been sold. So they sort of had these cut down ones shipped in the meantime. The operating system is written uh, in assembly language and there are three different versions. Ru one of them runs a single task, I think that's kind of an embedded system because it's just doing one job. There's a version that runs multiple tasks, but you have to define them all at sort of system build time. Again, that's maybe an embedded system. But the interesting one is the one that's variable tasks. So now I can come up to it and say, okay, do bakery valuations and it will run. Um, and this is a machine that's, you know, designed the process, punch cards and maybe store things on tape, things like that. Uh, modern IBM mainframes are still in some sense compatible with the system 360, which is quite extraordinary. You can go and get a ZOS mainframe and it will still run um, in some sense applications here. One of the, the nice features of the variable task, or the, at least the task switching, was disks um, were very slow. It, even in 1964, you're getting to the point where processor performance outstrips storage performance. And so if the program is stuck waiting for data from input, you just run a different program in the meantime. I mean, that is sort of fundamentally what operating systems do now. Um, but that is that is an old concept. You know, back in 1964, System 360 OS was doing that. Um, another nice feature, it, it was um, sort of portable across the System 360 range and uh, it helps make applications portable. So you could upgrade to a bigger System 360 and your applications would still run. Whereas you can imagine the Leo software was very specifically coded for, for a specific Leo machine. Talk about another remnant from the past. Anyone ever heard of Multix? This was uh, MIT, General Electric and Bell Labs, 1969. So we're almost in the 70s. And this is the operating system written for the General Electric 645 uh, mainframe. Curious machine, we have 36-bit words with 18-bit addresses and 18-bit segments. So again, it doesn't, everything doesn't have to be divisible by eight. This one's fun. There's no distinction between files and RAM. If you want to read from file, you tell the operating system, I'll have that file, please. And it says, it is now available at this range of addresses. And then you just do a read from addresses. And the operating system will then go and get the bits from the disk. Um, but basically, everything is memory mapped, which is kind of cool we have dynamic linking. So we have this idea of shared objects that could be in memory and shared between multiple tasks, which is very cool for 1969. We have a hierarchical file system, so we can store things in directories. It's pretty powerful stuff. We even have the concept of kernel versus user space, which looks pretty neat. So Multics, powerful system, but requires a big, expensive uh, computer to run which is where we get to um, another operating system from history that thankfully none of us ever have to uh, think about anymore, and that is Unix. Uh, Bell Labs, 1969, uh, written by Thompson and Ritchie. Um, Unix is a single tasking, non-portable operating system, and it is written in assembly to do one thing. And does anybody know what Unix is designed to do? It is designed to play the game Space Travel, written by Thompson and Ritchie, because they found if they ran it on the Multics machine, it cost them $75 in CPU time, which is a bit expensive for playing one round of, of Space Travel. It was sort of a solar system simulator. They found a spare PDP-7, and so they wrote a Multics knockoff in Assembler on the PDP-7, so they could play Space Travel for free. Um, they introduced them um, uh, within Unix. They have the concept of processes, device files, again, a hierarchical file system. Um, annoyingly, and cursing the rest of us for, for time then on, it proved to be quite a useful uh, system. Particularly, I think it was Bell Labs were doing proce um, process and patent applications, and they needed to format their patent applications. The PDP-7 was around. Um, later, they ported it to a, to a PDP-11. Um, but someone had access to this machine, and so they wrote a text formatting system called ROF, and that allowed them to do text formatting. And this proved quite useful. People are like, oh, oh, 
okay, I can do work with this. Maybe I'll get a machine and run Unix on it. And that's where this um, terrible mess of an operating system that's only ever supposed to play space travel sort of spiraled out of control. If you go into the user share man folder on your brand new $3,000 MacBook with its ARM processor, the man pages are all still in ROF format because fundamentally this is still Unix. Um, it was, of course, rewritten in C in 1973. It didn't remain in, in PDP assembler. Um, thankfully, that language is also consigned to history and we don't need to concern ourselves with it. Um, Unix family tree. Well, we start with Bell Labs. Uh, they released multiple versions of research Unix. I believe you would get it on a tape. You would just sort of order it and they would, they would send you the tape for that on. Um, then AT&T get involved and there are two versions of AT&T Unix, System 3 and System 5. You will often see references to SVR5 when you look at Unix things. That's system SVR5 is system five release five. So the SV is system five. Um, so, so yeah, an early AT&T Unix. That then went out to various computer manufacturers and we got HP UX, uh, press F to pay respects for silicon graphics, sad. IBM still with us, Sun, yeah, Sun sadly no longer with us. Um, in parallel, sort of with this, we have the Berkeley software distribution. So the University of California, Berkeley are doing their own thing with these tapes they've got from Bell Labs. And that formed um, Sun Sun OS and also then became NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly BSD, Ghost BSD. There's, there's lots of siblings in the, in the BSD family. Um, an operating system called Next Step, and Steve Jobs during his time in the wilderness away from the Apple, away from Apple, started Next, um, made these 68K machines running Next Step. Um, that operating system obviously died a death, we've never heard of it. Oh wait, that's not true. Steve Jobs brought it back to Apple and just relabeled it Mac OS X or OS X. Uh, if you've ever done Objective-C programming and you wondered why the fundamental object was called NS object, NS stands for Next Step. It's all just next step. Okay, so the, so the comment is NS may in fact stand for next and sun because sun was uh, involved in this one. Yeah, I do, I think I remember reading that sun were, were looking at this, but um, obviously they decided to go in there because sun were using 68K machines originally and then Sun switched to Spark instead. Um, so that may be where they sort of forked away from, from Next Step. Um, uh, Microsoft also had a Unix variant called Xenix, maybe Xenix, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Um, a brief summary of the Unix family tree, if you like, that is, that is the short version. Um, yeah, almost certainly impossible to read. Uh, uh, Linux and, and the GNU, we will talk about a bit later. We can have a long argument as to whether that is in fact Unix or not. Clues in the name though. Other operating systems, let's pour one out for digital research, intergalactic digital research as they originally were, and the control program for microcomputers. Ran on 8-bit um, Intel 8080 machines or in 1974. These are, when we get into the home computer market, so these are far cut down machines compared to what the, the Unix mainframes uh, were doing. Um, and we can go through all of these, Altair, Imzai, Osborne, K-Pro, Commodore, Sinclair. We can have a long argument in the pub as to whether Amstrad is dead. I mean, Alan Sugar is still on The Apprentice, so maybe, they, maybe we don't need to pull one out for them. But all of these companies produce machines that ran CPM. So here we get this idea of an operating system that's really portable and it's applicable to lots of, lots of different computers from lots of different manufacturers pretty reasonable system requirements. You need an ASCII terminal, so um, ZPT100 or 220, something like that. You need a floppy drive and you only need 16K of RAM. It only supports one user and it only supports one task at a time. So it's much simpler compared to a Unix, which, which needed an MMU and did lots of fancy things. The neat part of this system is that the, the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, the people who made the machine, would, um, would write the BIOS, the basic input output system, whereas digital research would supply you the basic disk operating system and the command console processor that stands for. So we sort of split into two. You have one piece which is generic and then one piece which is very hardware specific. So we've even taken this operating system and divided it in half. And we've got a generic half 
and a machine specific part. Um, the file system, however, is not hierarchical. They didn't get that far. You just have the root directory. There are no directories in CPM. There are users, which is a little bit like a directory. It's like a different version of the same disk, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't have directories in the normal sense. Um, the file copy program is called PIP. No idea why it's called PIP. And it understands pseudo files, so special file names, which mean don't actually make me a file on disk do a thing with a device driver. So if you want to copy your file to the console, you say pip con equals a colon file.txt, and it will print it on the screen, as opposed to making a uh, file called con. Um, if you grab the notes later, you can click through a video there, and I'll it's a walkthrough I've done of using Turbo Pascal 3 on a modern CPM machine, the RC2014. It's a surprisingly productive environment. I've got a got an, an editor, I can compile and debug and run all within the, the editor. It's um, really quite happy. Another operating system uh, worth going through, this is the Microsoft DOS, or as IBM called it, PC DOS. And this was the one for the IBM PC 5150 we saw earlier. That machine, as we said, had a 16-bit 8088, um, and it came with basic in ROM, tape interface, up to 64K of RAM. There's many versions of this story, but the fundamental bit is digital research had the market for home operating systems. IBM went to them, and for whatever reason, they failed to do a deal. Whether they were, he was out flying his, um, Gary Kildall was out flying his airplane, or for whatever reason, they didn't sign the deal. So IBM went to the people who sold them the basic and said, you're doing us the basic, can you do us an OS? And Microsoft said, yes, sure knowing they didn't have one, and then immediately just went out and bought one. Classic Microsoft. So Microsoft buy um, SCP DOS from Seattle Computer Products. They also hire its developer, Tim Patterson. They may even have just bought Seattle Computer Products. I've got someone in the audience who's going to correct me here. So the question is, why didn't IBM just go and buy DOS from, from SCP DOS, um, from, from SCP? Why would they need to? They went to their basic vendor and said, can we have an operating system? And the basic vendor said, yes. So at that point, IBM are like, problem solved. They, maybe they just didn't know that IBM just immediately went around and went, right, lads, I've sold <laughs> I've sold an operating system. Does anyone have one? Um, and no enough, yeah, they managed to find one in Seattle. It is sort of a clone of, of CPM. The, the system APIs at the lowest level are very similar to CPM. And it did sort of get Microsoft in a bit of trouble with CPM, with digital research later on. The very clever bit is Microsoft only licensed it to IBM. They retained the rights to sell copies to anyone else. IBM wouldn't care. Why do you want to run IBM's PC DOS on any other kind of computer? You'd need to buy an IBM PC to run PC DOS. Yeah, until Columbia Data Products managed to reverse engineer the IBM BIOS. They have a BIOS that's functionally equivalent to the IBM one, but doesn't invalidate any of their copyrights. Um, actually, Compaq then came along and did it properly later, and Compaq did the first PC compatible. Microsoft is then very happy to sell MS-DOS to anyone, and at this point, CPM is doomed. CPM 86 was available on the IBM PC. Eventually, it cost more than MS-DOS. Nobody bought it. It was also available with UCSD P system which is a spectacular system based around a bytecode virtual machine and a Pascal compiler. Um, so if you think Java was anything novel in the 2000s, nope. UCSDP system was compiling down to bytecode in a VM long before. Worth going over that. MS-DOS um, has a similar idea with pseudo files, except they apply operating system wide and not just to the copy command. So con is a pseudo file with special properties. When directories were added in MS-DOS 2, these special files had to exist in every directory because programs were written not knowing directories were a thing, and so con and orcs have to work everywhere, which is why to this day you still can't create a file called con.txt on Windows 11 because con is still a reserved file name, um, which is just spectacular. Let's talk through, so briefly through some other Microsoft operating systems, looking for time. Um, yeah, click me if you dare. Some of you saw it on the way, and we're going to watch this video because I've watched it enough, and you need to suffer. I'm, I'm not sharing. I'm sharing the pain today. So Microsoft with MS-DOS, Xenix, 
OS2 with IBM, you could spend at least 90 minutes talking about that. That was a disaster. 16, uh, 16 bit Windows, one version two, version three. Microsoft obviously have great grasp of, uh, of numbering. So after three, we have 95, when they went sort of 16, 32 bit, 95, 98, me, and it is me, not Emmy. Uh, videos from the time, you'll see Bill Gates referring to Windows me all the time, that is what it was called. Uh, and then their 32 bit line, which was NT, which we will talk about in a minute. Uh, let's click the link. Let's see what happens. This is an advert for Windows 386, which is what Windows 2.1 was known as, and it is the most knuckle gnawingly awful video you have ever seen. <laughs> this is the top version. This is 12. Okay, T Bone, time for some serious crunching. <laughs> I'm using Windows, Windows, Windows 386. So all my applications are running at once. My report right now is scattered all over my disk. Oh, whoa, whoa, Windows. We'll pull these parts together real quick. I got pieces in one spreadsheet. I got pieces in another. I got pieces that have never been close to one another. Some are in the database where things are pretty stuffy. Some are in the word oh, processor. Yeah. That's where it gets fluffy. Whoa, 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 Windows, whoa, whoa, Windows, Windows 386. We'll pull these parts together and do it mighty quick. I'll cut and paste, cut and paste until it's in PageMaker. Then I'll flick it up to be T-Bone's Heartbreaker. Here's a spreadsheet data you asked for, Linda. William! Linda! Uh-oh. These are one, two, three files. That doesn't look like one, two, three. It's not, not, not. One, two, 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 three, but don't worry, William. Just hand the disk to me. I've got several applications looking mighty slick, running under Windows 386. In one of the windows, I've got one, two, 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 three, running at the same time as the others. Can't you see? I can cut and paste your files into my report, or I can make them look better with Microsoft Chop. Choices, choices, choices. Is what I got. Now I'm gonna show you how to make this thing look hot. Up in accounting, nothing ever looks hot. <laughs> Here's a, here's a screenshot of Windows 1.0. It's only known as the MS-DOS executive at this point. Um, these windows cannot overlap. It is a windowing system, but the windows will bang into each other. Yeah, it is, it is a tiling window manager. That is, that is what it is. Uh, let's whiz through Windows NT. Came out in 1993. Does anyone know why it was called NT 3.1? Yeah, it was new technology, but Windows 3.1 was already out and they couldn't call it NT1 because people would think it was much older. So they just gave it the same version number as Windows 3.1, so it didn't seem out of date. Um, it's designed to be portable. It was actually built on MIPS and ported to x86 later. Um, it's an operating system designed to run lots of different types of program. It's compatible with OS2, POSIX, 16-bit Windows, 32-bit Windows, and it was built by Dave Cutler, who they hired from digital. Did get into a slight problem because the Windows NT manual looks exactly the same as the VMS manual because all the APIs are basically exactly the same. Uh, Microsoft gave them 100 million quid and ported NT to DEC Alpha to say sorry. Fair enough. 
uh, Apple. Did I have a brief run through on uh, on Apple operating systems from the past? Apple One has 256 bytes of Wasmon. It's that is all it comes with. If you want basic, you've got to type machine code or assembly instructions into Wasmon to do enough to then get it to load it in from, from tape or somewhere else. Uh, with the Apple II, you finally get basic included. It's an integer basic. Uh, I think Woz wrote it. They then eventually go and get the floating point basic from Microsoft. That's the difference between Apple integer basic and Apple floating point basic to floating point ones. Microsoft, uh, Lisa OS is quite extraordinary, really, what they were able to do at the time, um, obviously ripping off the GUI from Xerox Star. However, the Lisa machine itself was unbelievably expensive and no one really bought it. The thing that did catch on was the sort of cut down version of the Lisa based on the 68K, the Macintosh, uh, the, ran an operating system called System. System ran on 68K, but was then later ported to the PowerPC. Um, so it's sort of weird that the big all singing, all dancing one died a death, whereas the little tiny cut down one that really got traction and people liked it and they shipped updates and eventually far overtook what, what Lisa um, OS could do. Uh, Mac OS 10, as we said before, that came from Next Step uh, and is in fact, a, a, was Unix certified. I don't know if they certify every release, but definitely releases of Mac OS 10 in the past have had the official stamp from whoever is currently the Unix consortium. So while maybe not derived immediately from the Unix family tree constitutes a Unix because it's the same. Here is an example of, I think that's system three, the early version of, of Apple system. Of course, completely black and white display. There's only two colors, black and white. Um, shades of gray are just done by, by dithering. Let's pull one out for maybe my favorite computer company, Commodore. What a train wreck that turned out to be. The 8-bit machines uh, ran Microsoft Basic. Did Commodore have a DOS? Yes. Where did the DOS run? On the floppy drive. Floppy drive had a 6502 all of its own and 2K of RAM. You would simply send a message over the serial cable that said, open this file, and the floppy drive would send a message back over the serial cable saying, done. The Commodore 64 and the PET had no idea where the files were on disk. That was the disk drive's problem. So really interesting that they were split out. Um, yeah, sad, Amiga OS. Amiga OS is extraordinary, and it is sad that it was horrendously mismanaged. It was comprised of exec, a multitasking kernel. Um, we had Amiga DOS, which is actually a port of the Cambridge University operating system, Tripos, which operates by message passing. So it was super efficient. Uh, doesn't work when you've got split address space because it relies on task A just passing pointers into task B. But they didn't have that on the uh, on the Amiga because they couldn't afford an MMU. If it had had an MMU, it probably would have run Unix, but it didn't. So Tripos was the next best thing. The GUI was called Intuition, and the bits of operating system that are on ROM is known as Kickstart, which is why it's a weird operating system because it has lots of different names for lots of different bits. Um, a workbench is the is the desktop. There is the Amiga workbench. You think this so this is the this is workbench two, but it's fundamentally the same as workbench one. You think that came out in 1986 for general availability, and then you remember that screenshot of Windows, which didn't have overlapping windows and sort of looks like text mode. This and this is multitasking, and I can run different screen modes at the same time, and I can run a full screen graphics application behind the desktop. I can just grab the bar at the top of the screen, drag it down, and have a full screen game running behind it. Um, the operating system is extraordinary, and it's it, it's still kind of going now. You can get versions that run on, on PowerPC, but yeah, it, what, what could have been? Let's pull one out for Atari. Um, there was an Atari OS, ran on the 8-bit machines. Uh, TOS was the operating system for the 16-bit Atari ST, the operating system which was in fact just a rebadged uh, digital research gem desktop. So that's what they got up to after CPM. They wrote gem DOS and the gem desktop. Not many people picked it up. I think Amstrad shipped a couple of gem machines, Atari did, and we had Multitos. Uh, that's what gem looks like. Um, again, it's this is sort of mid eighties and really it's better than Windows at this point. And it is, I'd say it was weird that Windows took off and these operating systems didn't because they had a lot of really powerful features. 
whether you put that down to Microsoft's sharp business practices or not, I couldn't possibly comment. We could discuss that in the bar later. Yet another, yeah, yet another sad thing from my past. Yeah, Acorn, again, another tragic tale of mismanagement. They ran the machine operating system on the BBC Micro Moz, which include the disk filing system. BBC Basic is sensational. Sophie Wilson did an absolutely unbelievable job with it. We had callable procedures. We had inline assembler um, with a basic program. It is, yeah, go and dig out BBC Basic. It's very, very impressive. For 1981, just extraordinary. Uh, they never had a 16-bit mach machine. They went straight to 32-bits with RISC OS. It's first called Arthur, but they renamed it and they have the advanced disk filing system. It's still going. You can get Risk OS on a Raspberry Pi. We can tell this is a Risk OS screenshot because we have a large bar at the bottom with all of the currently running applications and everything has a marble texture because that's just classic Risk OS. You've got a kind of a high-speed blitter. And you, can, you can blit bitmaps. Why not just make everything marble colored? Uh, interestingly, in the middle, you see where it says draw file. That's the file save as dialog. Does anyone know how you specify which directory that file is about to be saved into? Oh, I don't see some nods. It's drag and drop. The only way to specify where that file goes is to drag it into an open directory window. There is no built-in directory browser in the app because the operating system's got one. You click on the disk drive in the bottom left and you navigate through to the folder you want. Why would you then build another one into every single application? I've got one. Just open the directory you want, drag the file in. And uh, <laughs> it, 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 when you're really used to this model, it just makes sense. And yeah, sadly missing. Uh, let's talk about Linux. So um, I'm not going to, well, actually interject you here, but Linux is a kernel and the operating system is largely GNU. And GNU is not Unix because the clue's in the name. It is a complete open source ground up rewrite of Unix-like utilities because didn't like the licenses that Unixes were available under. Um, however, these days, it's sort of a pick and mix operating system because there's a lot of non-GNU components. Uh, X11 was never a GNU thing. That was uh, MIT, I think. And that only displays pixels. You then need to choose a window manager. And that's where distributions like Ubuntu and Arch and Slackware come along because they have pick and mixed for you. They have assembled all of these pieces and constructed an operating system. And these days, it might include systemd and Pipewire and Wayland, and it's, it's a mess, which is why you can't really say Linux is an operating system, because uh, Alpine Linux boots the Linux kernel and then has a muzzle C library and uses Clang and everything statically linked, whereas Ubuntu uses GNU C library and GCC, and really they're very different. They've got the same kernel, and the C libraries look a bit similar on the outside, but they are... If, we, if I knew how to, to administer an Ubuntu machine and I walked up to an Alpine machine, I am well out of luck because it is completely different. I thought they compiled Alpine with Clang. Feel free to check me on Wikipedia, someone, and pull me up on that in the bar afterwards. It definitely uses Muzzle C rather than Glibc. So where are we today after 53 minutes and a romp through computing history and a large number of drinks poured out? Um, the operating system today, well, yeah, Commodore, CPM, IBM, it's all gone. We are left with basically two. Microsoft Windows NT and POSIX, the Portable Operating System Interface X. I don't know what the X stands for. Um, but this is the idea of unifying all of the many various Unixes, and POSIX is this standard you can meet, and all of the Unixes generally meet POSIX, including Mac OS, um, including... Uh, Linux with, with GNU, it's all mostly POSIX compliant. POSIX is in some ways a terrible API and there are lots of issues with it, things like POSIX threading, but it's what we've got. It's probably better than Windows 32. Maybe you consider the web browser to be an operating system. It's certainly going in that direction. I mean, you can boot Mac OS 7 in a web browser. Just They compiled a Mac emulator down to JavaScript and just shipped it. So I don't know. Again, more discussions for the bar. Let's talk about Windows NT. Uh, we have kernel versus user space. The kernel API is private, and the only legal way to talk to the kernel is through the libraries the operating system gives you. This gives Microsoft the ability to change the kernel at will, as long as the C library um, interface remains the same. You can't send syscalls to the kernel in Windows. It's not allowed. You call 
C library functions. We have executables, dynamic link libraries. The paths look like this with the slashes going the wrong way. I think that originally came from MS-DOS where before directories were invented, they'd use the forward slash character to do command line arguments. So if you want to do dir slash w, um, and then when directories are invented, they're like, well, if we use that slash for the directories, it's going to be confusing. So we'll just use the other one. Um, Q40, countless years of, of just absolute confusion because the slashes go the wrong way. And the reason I don't like it is because in C and in Rust, you have to escape them because that's the escape character. Why do you use the escape character as your directory separator? Um, oh, mind boggles. We get functions like create file A. Again, I could spend 90 minutes ranting about the difference between ASCII and wide string APIs and why Microsoft basically jumped on the Unicode bandwagon five years too early and they should have waited like Plan 9 did and done it properly. But you are left with two copies of every Windows API routine, one ASCII, one with wide strings. Uh, if we look at the Linux sort of flavored version of POSIX, the kernel API is now public and the programs can make syscall instructions. You normally call a C library, you don't have to. The kernel syscall API is listed in the header files and it is stable, it's different between architectures, but it's stable between, usually stable between releases. Um, so you can just jump straight into the kernel. We get slashes in the Unix way round and we get functions like open. Mac OS is sort of a mix of the two. The kernel API is now private again, but everything else sort of looks Unixy. We've got forward slashes, we've got open. So when we run our applications, what sort of features is the operating system giving them? Well, we have functions for file handling, open, close, read, write, dealing with directories. It's sort of fairly straightforward stuff, fairly common between the two kinds of operating system. Might have different names, but same concepts. We have APIs to start and stop programs or for applications. Excuse me. So we can run different applications at different times, and there's one application can start another application. This is all again fairly similar between them. And we have this idea of console handling. So there's some sort of destination to which characters can be sent and from which characters are received. In the olden days, that would have been a teletype. You might remember when we saw the IBM System 360, there was a big typewriter in front of it. That was a teletype. You type on the typewriter, bytes go into the machine. The machine has output, bytes go into the teleprinter, and it prints out uh, using a sort of a daisy wheel or a, a golf ball head. I still have that idea today. If I fire up a virtual terminal on my Mac, a terminal window, that is a pseudo teletype. That is a virtual teletype. That is literally what it is. I type, bytes go into the kernel. When the applications run, bytes come back into my terminal. We also have APIs for drawing windows, doing 2D, 3D graphics and video. It's interesting that APIs for drawing buttons and standard widgets seem to have gone out of fashion. Um, yeah, again, we can have a long, at least a 90 minute discussion about why that is, but the idea that your operating system simply provides you a rectangle and the application paints the entire contents itself um, seems to be much more prevalent. Um, which you know helps when you want to port your applications to run in a web browser, but I think lends a certain inconsistency to a standard desktop, which is a bit sad. You definitely don't get that on Risk OS. Everyone just uses the Risk OS widget for a button and everything just looks consistent. Whereas on Windows, the Windows APIs are kind of terrible, so nobody uses them. So is that a button or is that just a rectangular graphic with a word in the middle? Kind of hard to tell. Uh, what else does an operating system normally give you? Well, we've got memory management, dealing with networks, processes, and threads. Uh, when you've got processes and threads, you then need remote process communication or inter-process communication. We need locks. We need to be able to grab resources. These are the sorts of things operating systems give us. Brief mention on the difference between an API and an ABI, because that will be relevant later. An API is basically for source level compatibility. It says, I have these functions with these parameters in these orders. Um, and you can compile that for multiple CPU architectures. An application binary interface is at a lower level. It says, when I call this function, this argument is in register R0, this argument is in register R1, and the other the arguments all got pushed onto the stack in this order with this padding. And that's very important when you jump from one program to the other, because there is no mechanism in any of these operating systems to say, 
what the call site looks like when you jump to a function. The best you have is the function's name is this, and it has these four arguments. The rules for how arguments get turned into stack addresses or registers is defined by the operating system. You can't ask it. They have to follow the same set of rules. Um, and that's why the, the ABI is so important. Maybe we'll see things change. Um, Google's Fuchsia, I think, uses FIDL, which is a sort of a different way of describing APIs. But basically, this is where we're stuck. If you ever have a spare 15 minutes, go and look at ARM 64 EC. Uh, Microsoft took the standard ARM ABI uh, and then changed it. And they've changed the ARM 64 e ABI to look a lot like the Intel 64-bit one. And the reason they've done this is to make it easier to jump from ARM code to Intel code because Windows is not entirely written for ARM. There's a whole bunch of Intel bits in it, and you might be running an Intel version of Word or whatever. And it allows you to jump from ARM code to Intel code. You just fire up a, an Intel processor emulator and give it access to the processor's memory. And when the Intel code gets to pull stuff off the stack, it is where it expects it to be because the ABI has been changed. So on the ARM side, it put it in the places that an Intel chip would expect, which is pretty clever. If you don't have that, you basically have to disassemble the stack from ARM format and then reassemble it with whatever padding and spacing rules that the, the Intel chip has. Briefly, let's, let's talk about um, programming languages and what they do to kind of hide the difference between operating systems. So, you know, I guess the standard template library, that should, should kind of work no matter what operating system you're on. Python's got a pretty powerful standard library. I can do, you know, file.open on Python and it just works. Doesn't matter if it's Windows or even Risk OS or Unix, they've hidden away the differences. Go, Rust, these languages all have pretty powerful standard libraries that, that just hide operating system differences. Uh, and a brief mention for Sigwin, which valiantly attempts to bring POSIX to Windows NT. Uh, Microsoft decided the easiest thing to do was just to ship Linux with Windows. Um, so that's what they think. Finally, so that is, uh, we're on the hour. Good. It's about on time. That is a history of the operating system and an update of where we are today with operating systems. Let's look at what I decided to build and why I decided to build one. Because maybe there's enough in the world. Maybe we don't need another one. So what is the Neotron? Well, the idea of the Neotron, the Neotron OS, is to be just enough operating system. It is the bare minimum that I would consider to make a usable um, general purpose computer in that, I say usable, I'm aiming for kind of CPM or MS-DOS2 levels of functionality. I can run programs, I can walk up to it and type some stuff, make it do a thing. It's not an embedded system, it's general purpose, but it's not a lot else in there. You know, load of applications, portable, yeah. It needs to be understandable. I wanted to make an operating system that was big enough to be useful, but small enough that one person could hold it in their head. You can go and get uh, Unix release six for risk five. That's a course somebody gives at a university somewhere, but it all just feels a bit big. There's a bit much there. Just trim it down. We don't need memory management. We don't need processes. Let's just dial it right down to the minimum. So we can understand what is the essence of a computer. And that's what I wanted to get out here. I wanted to make it open source because that's something I believe in. And I wanted to run it on open hardware, which is kind of a new idea, but it's something I'm quite keen on because, uh, you know, as, as with all those Commodore machines, they were never open hardware. They were fixed by the manufacturer. And it takes a lot of reverse engineering now to go and recreate them because they're old and they're broken work anymore. So let's just make things open from the start. Let's give everybody the schematics, not just the Gerber files, but the schematics and all the information they need to take the system and adapt it. It's the same thing for open source software, but for hardware. Why don't I just use a Windows Mac Linux machine? Well, you know, I do. And the OS APIs are fine. You can probably understand most of the APIs available on a machine. The problem, I think, is the kernels. Uh, kernels are extraordinarily complicated, and especially because of the drivers. The example, uh, Linux is about 25 million lines, of which 2.5 million are the AMD GPU driver, and of those, 1.8 million are auto-generated header files. 
how does anyone begin to understand the Linux kernel when you've got drivers of that complexity? You see people go, yeah, here's a driver for a thing. Uh, BIOS on the card is written in x86 and we wanted the card to work on power, so we just shipped an x86 VM with the driver so we could execute stuff. It's just extraordinarily complicated and I really huge respect for the people who try and maintain this because it is it's absolutely wild. Um, and if you expand out to, does anyone understand Ubuntu as a thing? I mean, there must be thousands of programs installed there by default, each with maybe 40 years of history behind it as to why it's the way it is. Just for me, they're just too big and they're too old. They have to carry a lot of historical baggage. See, Windows having two copies of every string API. So what is the Neotron OS? What do you get? Well, it's a flat 32-bit address space. It's designed to run on, on Cortex-M, so we have that flat 32-bit address space. Um, the OS API is just a jump table. So rather than syscalls, I thought about this a lot, and I decided instead of doing syscalls, instead of doing an SVC instruction, when the BIOS starts the operating system, it's just going to give it a structure full of function pointers. And then when the operating system starts an application, it's going to give it a different structure full of function pointers. If you want to open a file, call the open function. If you want to close the file, somewhere in there is a field called close, call that function pointer. And then the operating system is free to rearrange itself internally. The operating system could use syscalls if it wants. The close function could just call the syscall for that, or it could. Yes, question. Yes, that is pretty similar to how Omega OS worked. Yeah. So you wouldn't you wouldn't call the, the machine instruction but do a software interrupt. You had to go through the library. And that's what made code portable across Amigas. If you ignored those rules and you looked at your Amiga 500 and you went, well, I'm just going to jump to that address because I know that's where the hardware is or I know that's what's in ROM, then when the 500 plus comes out, you're stuffed because the 500 plus has a very small label on the box and an entirely different ROM inside the machine. And if you've made a load of assumptions about using Kickstart 1.3 that are all broken in Kickstart 2 because it was rewritten from BCPL to C for starters, everything inside was different. But if you followed the rules and you only used the jump table, then you have, you have really good portability. We have executables. We don't have shared objects. I can't load two executables at once. So what's the point of sharing anything between them? Just if you want to do overlays and swap stuff out the disk, feel free. There is no privilege level difference between user space and kernel space. There is no kernel space. Applications can do what they want. You can write over the operating system. You have full control of the machine. Just the same as MS-DOS. It's fine. Somebody wrote Windows for MS-DOS. You could probably write a Windows equivalent for this, giving you all the tools that you need. Um, the paths are a little bit curious. I have proper Unix slashes because Windows ones upset me. Uh, but instead of drive letters, I've gone for volume numbers. And there's also... Um, a fairly detailed mechanism, it's all in the book, for describing device files um, where you would put the drive letter on Windows. So instead of being a special file, a special file name that exists on any drive, we've got um, drives that are, in fact, devices. And then you can pass in parameters like the board rate for your serial port, things like that. This is an example of the open function. We take a string, we take a mode, and then we return a, a result. It's like a variant. Maybe the open works, maybe it doesn't. Um, why am I not just building embedded systems? Well, because I've built loads of them and they're kind of boring to me at this point. Um, and I like the idea of Amigas and an old Commodore machine. So I wanted to say, can I do something like that? And why is it open? Well, because I hope that it lasts longer this way. I hope that it is useful for people for educational purposes. Um, why don't I sell it? I just don't need the money. I get paid to do my job, fine. Just Give it away. Let's hope it proves useful to someone somewhere. And if not, well, I have fun anyway. So what does my sort of basic Neotron computer look like? Well, keyboard, SD card for storage. They're kind of nice. You can talk to them over SDI. We can write blocks. Uh, some kind of audio codec. So I do have an audio codec on this board. Sorry for the people on Zoom. I'm pointing off screen where you can't see me. Um, I'll, I'll try and pick it up and wave it around afterwards, but I'm not going to unplug it right now because everything's going to go wrong. Um, we have an audio codex. We can do sort of stereo audio in and out and some kind of video display. Um, so I'm doing 
VGA video. Fundamentally, the applications don't care. They just get a text console. It's the operating system's job to arrange the characters. And then we'll see that I've got a BIOS like CPM that does the hardware. Then it's the BIOS's job to actually drive pixels. So what have I got? Well, I've got file handling for that SD card. We've got VGA monitor, PS2 keyboard support. That's a work in progress. It turns out that's non-trivial. Um, and there will be some sort of very basic memory management. But you think about CLI programs you run on, uh, on Linux, the various tools you use, tools that don't use huge amounts of RAM. You know, they're fairly, fairly, uh, fairly simple command line utilities. The, the classic Unix ones, said, orc, grep. You could probably run something pretty similar on Neutron OS. You just need open a file, read some stuff, print to the standard output, allocate a bit of memory. Most of these are streaming utilities. Um, you can't pipe them together because I can't run multiple commands at the same time. So you'd have to take input from disk, run it through your tool, and then spit it back out to disk. But you can get, you know, I think some fairly, fairly complex systems could be architected by assembling simple pieces that would fit in, uh, in this context. Uh, what am I not doing? Well, no, I'm not doing networking, not doing processing threads, we're not doing locks and RPC. Someone wants to tackle that, feel free. Um, more than enough on my plate. Networking would be interesting. Um, so yeah, we've covered um, we've covered the portability thing already. Why is it written in Rust? Well, because I think it has this great trifecta. It's high performance. I'm not. Uh, I don't have to uh, defer to a lower level. There's no virtual machine. I am straight on the hardware. I have access to all of the hardware and all of its performance. The developer experience is excellent, and we will try and show that in a minute. Um, my company's done a lot of work around the embedded developer experience, uh, and we've produced various tools to, to try and push that forward, so we'll show off some of those. And it just has a really nice community. They're just a bunch of nice people, and they're a bunch of nice people who remember what it was like to not understand the language, because everyone has learned Rust in the last 10 years, except maybe the three people who were doing it in Mozilla but we all remember what it was like to not understand what a box was or what a trait was. So, um, and they're pretty aggressive about enforcing their code of conduct and saying, no, not standing for that. This is, you know, this is an open, fair space that we, we all share. So a lot of respect for the people behind the project. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's got a lot going for it. Um, and then we briefly touched on the, the BIOS DOS split. Um, a little bit of technical detail perhaps on how we're going to do this. So there's a common operating system and then the BIOS customized for each board. And like with C++, when you change compiler version, the ABI changes. They have the freedom to change how arguments are stacked and so on. And the BIOS and the OS may be compiled with different versions of Rust. So we have to tell Rust, please make these functions exportable in a C compatible way. We tell them, tell it to make extern C functions. Um, and then we just give it a structure full of function pointers. So the structure might look like this. I've only trimmed it down to only one, um, one function there to get a bit on the slide. But I've got a struct, which is a static string, contains a pointer and a length. And then my BIOS API for get version returns a static string. So the operating system can call get version. Um, and that's a function pointer. Uh, it can jump to the function pointed to by that pointer, and it will get back an object. And Rust and C, or two different versions of Rust, will agree on how API static string is laid out in memory, because I've marked it with repra C. I've told it to use a C representation. Normally, Rust is allowed to reorder the fields in your structure, because it can do that for performance reasons. Um, again, one reason why you have to use the same version of Rust every time, uh, because they might disagree in how it, it's been reordered. You tell it to do repra C, everything just gets fixed in a manner that's compatible with the standard C compiler for your platform. What would an operating system look like that used this API? We've got a couple of mutable global variables, their options, or I guess variants, because we want to initialize them to none. Rust will not let you initialize global variables pre-main. I can't put code in there. I can't call a constructor. I can only have static initialization. So it's quite common to see your global variables marked as options, set them as none um, statically, and then you change them to be something later on. Uh, because they're static mutes, I've had to 
unsafely change them. Rust reasonably says these global variables can be mutated from anywhere at any time, and even two threads simultaneously might change them. And therefore, the act of changing them or even reading them, I'm not going to let you do because you could be updating and write, reading and writing at the same time and get corruption or get inconsistent values. He says, I don't like that. So what I've had to say is I've had to say unsafe. We had this discussion on Twitter the other day. Unsafe means don't worry, Rust. I've got this. This is legit. Trust me. It doesn't mean you get to break the rules. It means the compiler is telling you it was unable to verify the rules for you, so you have manually verified the rules for the compiler. You're saying, trust me, this is OK. Because nobody else is reading or writing from these variables at this point in time, we're at the start of May. So it's fine. Actually, what I should have done is I should have hidden all that away inside some wrapper classes, um, some wrapper structs. Uh, so here we've got new. New is going to be a, a const fun, and it's going to initialize it to none. And then the init functions we have down in main that we're calling now, these do the unsafe thing internally. That's what I should have done uh, to work in progress. How does it look like for applications? Well, it works the same way. Instead of a BIOS API, you get an OS API, and then we will set up, jump you into a sort of normal main. You should be able to write your, fun your applications in C just as easy as you can write them in Rust. So what have we got? Well, hardware-wise, there's one version that uses a TI chip, which is the same sort of hardware platform I talked about last time I was at ACCU. Um, Jake, great chip crisis. You can't buy these chips anymore, but they're really hard to get hold of. And it was always a bit of a, a bit of a slog trying to get video out of the chip, not designed to do video. It used most of the processor pushing pixels. So I Raspberry Pi released the Pico. I went, wow, that's clever. I'll get some of that. So now I have two 133 megahertz Cortex M zeros, two 56K of RAM, hardware accelerated video that just pulls from RAM and runs in the background. And I can do sort of audio codec and SD card. Um, what's the form factor? Well, this is actually micro ATX size. It's designed to fit in a standard PC case because I wanted to make a PC. So I made it PC motherboard size. So I could just put it in an ATX case and wire up Standard PC keyboard, PC screen. I got diverted for a long while doing a board management controller. So that's a little ST chip in the corner that boots first. It does the power supply control and the keyboard control, and it runs the LEDs and things like that. It's open source. It's open hardware. If you want to make a circuit board and you need a little board management controller, just rip it off. It sits in the corner of the board. That's exactly what it's there to do. Um, and we've also put a bus on the system. So lots of machines in history have buses on them. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned, we mentioned, yeah, we've talked about PDP, so we've mentioned digital before. Um, but yeah, lots of machines in the past have a bus. I've got a bus. I have expansion slots. They carry SPI because almost no microcontrollers put out their address and data bus on pins. And if they did, you'd need a lot of pins because it's a 32-bit data bus and a 32-bit address bus. And that starts to be a very big chip. Um, so I'm using a serial. It's, it's like P, it's PCI Express to the PCI of the past is what it is. So we have a serial bus. We have some cute system for identifying cards that have been installed and so on. And this is what it looks like when it's running. So there is the micro ATX board. I have a second Raspberry Pi plugged in as a debugger. So the one at the top is being a JTAG debugger and it's plugged into the, well, the serial wire debug pins. On the um, on the Pico down there, which is the one that's actually the one that's actually doing the work is this one here. Um, I've got standard IBM PC 80 column 25 line text mode. Pretty cool. That is all I've got for my talk. Um, you can find me online. Come and check me out. Come and read the book. Follow these excellent people on Twitter. And I could take some questions. And while we do that, I'm going to try and set up a live programming demo. And we'll see if we can reflash the BIOS on this board and have everything appear on screen. Spoilers, the system's always booted. But let me, does anyone have any questions? Um, 
yeah, it's a, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. The question is, can I buy one? Um, and the answer is no, because there's a chronic chip shortage. So I, so I, I started building this um, a year or so, or so ago, and I've struggled to get the chips. The designs are all on GitHub. You can just send out the Gerbers to, to JLC PCB, get them to load all the little tiny resistors for you, basically free of charge. Um, be aware there are some errata in here. So if you wire it up as designed, it will blow up and put 12 volts through the, through the ST chip because one of the trans... I'm not, I'm not very good at electronics. I'm a software engineer hobbling around. But the idea is that you can either order it yourselves if you don't want five PCBs from JLC because that's the minimum order. Um, yeah, I may do sort of group buys occasionally, probably do it through Tindy or something like that. Let's see if I can set this to be... External display be a mirror. Yes, you are now. I'm, I'm confused as to why the thing's got away. It's not got away. You're just looking at the Mac over on the PC. So that is the machine that's running. That's not interesting. What's interesting is Visual Studio Code. So here is the source code in Rust for my BIOS. Um, Sorry, this is the source code for the operating system. I want to have open. Here is the source code for the BIOS. I like comments. I love heavily commented code. Do try and put lots of, I split my code into modules as well. I love sort of break it's just to say, this is what's going on here. I don't want a random struct down at the bottom of the file. I want all of the imports to be together, all of the structures to be together. Here is my jump table. So currently we've got um, basic sort of version stuff. We've got some simple ones for doing serial comms. So configuring the serial port um, sh should be a serial reading. I don't know where serial reads from. Uh, basic function for getting and setting the time because the BIOS is responsible for tracking time when it's off. Um, this is about storing persistent configuration so the operating system can produce a blob and give it to the BIOS and say, remember this, give it to me later. And then when you reboot the machine later, the BIOS can go, I don't know what this is, you have it. And inside it should say, you're in UK English mode and you've configured for VGA display on serial with this. Kind of. So that's the idea between that. And then these routines are all about uh, where does the video live in memory and what format is the video? They do have to agree at how much video memory there is, otherwise the operating system will very easily just go right off the end of the video memory. Um, yeah, ask me how I know. And then the final one in there is just about BIOS says, I have these pieces of memory. Because you could have external RAM. Some microcontrollers don't just have the lump of SRAM here. They have other bits of RAM at, at other places. Yep. If you put it in a bitmap mode rather than a text mode, yep, you just says the, 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 operate, the API the application gets will probably be here is a pointer, that's where video RAM lives. Play nicely, you've got eight bits per pixel. Here's where the palette lives. And you should be able to port yeah, loads of classic, loads of classic games over to it. Will it somebody did do Doom for the RP2040, but they had to use most of the flash chip. So they packed all of the wads into the flash because you can get ones with 16 megs of flash. You don't have enough RAM to load, you don't even have enough RAM to load all of the, the textures for Wolf's and Stein 3D. But if you maybe had procedurally generated textures, um, it's almost certainly fast enough to do much better ray casting than Doom or Wolf and Stein 3D could do. So you could imagine a sort of a flat shaded 3D world would work pretty nice. 133 megahertz, 32 bit ARM core is, you know, you've got some serious power. Uh, yeah, they they had to they had to do some serious trimming and compressing to get it even to fit in. I think they got all of the dooms will fit in the sixteen meg. I think they managed to get like shareware doom in the two meg version, but there's also bandwidth limits. Um, the external SBI flash is not that fast. It's designed to be cached through a little execute in place thing. You read from an address, the world stops. The hardware then goes and clocks a five twelve byte block out of the SBI flash into RAM and then restarts the process and says, here's the thing you asked for from RAM, 
So as long as you ask for things that are contiguous, you're all right. But if you start jumping all over Flash, you're going to do cache misses and you're going to stop the world and go and fetch things again. My system is designed with um, the operating system and the BIOS are in Flash. Applications get loaded into RAM. It's, it's simple. So the tools we've got here, if we want to build uh, a Rust program, we just say cargo build. We want to do the release profile because the debug build will be too big. Um, and I've previously built it, so it just says OK. But the really cool thing is we can say cargo run. What cargo run will do is normally it will run your program. But here, the, the pro project has been configured to shell out to a tool called probe run. And what probe run will do is it will find my debug probe over USB. It will connect to the microcontroller at the end of these cables. It will reflash the flash memory with the program. It will start the processor. It will register itself for faults. So if the processor crashes with a panic, I will get a dump on screen of the full stack backtrace. It will tell me if it's overflowed stack or use too much stack RAM. And it will also set up a real-time transport, which allows me to write log messages into RAM and then the debug probe will steal them from RAM at runtime without stopping the processor. So I now have a very low cost log mechanism. Even better than that, the log mechanism uses deferred formatting. So actually what goes in the log is a pointer to the format string and the integer arguments, say I'm printing whatever. I've got the binary on here because I've got the elf. So I get the pointer, I look in the elf and go, oh, that pointer points to this string. And now I can do the string formatting on the laptop. So the string, so sort of the equivalent of printf is done over here, not over there. That's just three words get written here. We get the, the, the text. And that works with structures and, and all kinds of things, all, all manner of rich format. So when I type cargo run, it does a build. The flashing currently is 52K, flashing 52K in. And then let's do that again. And I'm going to get the other window. Let's see if I can get this and get both on the screen at the same time, because that's going to change focus as soon as I do that. Okay. It's flashing. It's flashed. That is the BIOS. Runs at 640 by 480. It has now jumped to the operating system, which has reconfigured the video mode on the fly. That's definitely something my last system couldn't do. Um, I've set it to 80 by 50, because it looks a bit like Windows NT. Um, and it's basically it's printed a bunch of stuff on the screen just to check the scrolling work. But at the bottom, it has panicked. So the operating system has called panic, and it has dumped out. I was in source lib.rs, line 470, column 5, and the message was testing a panic. And then if we go over to the source code, and we go to the operating system, it's printing out all the dots, and then the very last line is panic. Testing a panic. So there we go. We are pretty much flat out of time. Two minutes for any more questions. Otherwise, you can come and peek at the hardware. And I might try and steal the camera from here. Yes, so Rust code uh, will can be debugged in GDB. We can teach GDB how to do Rust symbol. Um, Symbol mangling, so yeah, we can single step through. Because we've got the real-time trace, we generally don't need to. But for all the people on the video, there is the micro ATX form factor board. And so we've got a sort of standard selection of year 2000 connectors. Yeah. You can still buy the blue, pink, and green audio jacks from various suppliers. We've got uh, Super VJ video there. That's the Raspberry Pi Pico, and then SD card slot, 12 volt power. And you can still buy purple and green PS2 keyboard and mouse ports. So, and then the board management controller is down in this corner. So Real-time clock battery, uh, audio codec is around here somewhere with big fat capacitors. And then this bit up here is the video circuitry. The circuitry is all terrible, which is why the video is a bit pale and has terrible noise problems. But, so, yeah. um, Please do, yeah. I'm very happy to take pull requests. Yeah, it's an STM32 F031, and it is completely unobtainium, and they've gone from $1, which is why I picked it, to $12. Because 
scalpers are now buying them all and hoarding them in warehouses and because that's just how it is whereas raspberry pi have managed to avoid the scalper problem and if you need them for business you can just call raspberry pi and say i'll have a reel please and they will sell you them reels at a time at this price 75 cents for the chip um i think retail it's three pounds 60 with the board with the flash with the crystal with the usb connect three pounds 60 is mad I'm like, why do I have an STM32? I just put two Picos on it. And then I'm like, why do I have a dual core 133 megahertz board management controller that's job is to handle a keyboard and blink an LED? It seems like complete overkill. Um, on the other hand, the pricing is such that you're like, well, why not? Maybe I should just have a computer that's made of three Raspberry Pi Picos. Yeah. It's a six core machine. Yeah, because, because that chip is 40 micrometer and doesn't contain any flash. You can't use, they use the same process node that they use for the BCM 2835 and the, so not the 2835, the 2711, the one on the Raspberry Pi 4. There's 40 micrometer flat fab capacity available. And it's because they were able to do that because it doesn't have flash on it, which is why it has external flash, because flash needs different geometries. So really clever. Yeah, so, so the, the, like the STM32s, they're going to be fabbed on a much older process, and those fabs are much tighter capacity constraint. The die, because it's 40 micrometer, is minuscule. So even if they only get 100 wafers processed, it's like 22,000 cores per wafer. So, yeah, so the yield is good. Yeah, the number of um, wafers per die is really good. So they're in a pretty good position for and hoovering up custom from other people. I, I think it's as you go older, yeah. you're you're more constrained because um, as they're larger, you're getting fewer chips per die. And there's maybe fewer of those factories, or you've got more demand. So the ST stuff is all going to be on older process nodes, and that's what all the automotive people want. So that's where all the sort of congestion is. Nobody's going to make 130. Um, so why can it be 40 nanometers? Surely, yeah. But the, the one the point, yeah, point. I can't remember. The older ones, um, nobody's going to build new ones. I mean, they're talking about it, but why would you spend $5 billion to build a factory that makes 15-year-old chips when you could spend the same money and build a factory that makes modern chips? But because of the capacity constraints, people are actually thinking about that. So. Look at Evan Upton's Twitter because he's he's tweeted about it. He said he did say on Twitter, and I forget the precise numbers, how many wafers he has in stock sitting at TSMC, and how many uncut dyes he therefore has available, which is then how many months run rate at their normal shipping rate. Yeah, right. So, it, and and that that is a, another thing that's in their advantage. They they have only made. Cortex M0. If they'd gone for M3 and M4, the die would have been bigger. But actually, two M0s worked out smaller than I think one M4. Yeah. 